James Baroud. I'm the director of the Rothman Institute. And on behalf of the Institute, the Silverman College of Business here at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and the sponsors who made this program possible, I welcome you. For those of you new here today, including some of our panelists and our speaker, this building is a uh, former Twombly uh, Vanderbilt estate, and uh, it was built about 100 years ago. It was a weekend house for parties and balls. It came in from the city. And uh, some of you may notice that the grounds are sort of similar to Central Park. That's because Frederick Olmsted's firm designed the grounds. Um, on the rolling hillside behind me, you'll see the Institute, which is the white building with four or five big columns. And um, that's where we're located. So this is not the Rotham Institute. This is the mansion. I'd also mention that the Italian gardens and the fountains out back are lovely. So after the program, please take in um, those features on this gorgeous day. Innovation has been a hallmark of our program here at the Rothen Institute and Fairleigh Dickinson. We've been teaching this topic for 17 years. So that is our mission, to teach, study, and foster innovation and entrepreneurship. Speaking of our academic program, let me take a few seconds just to brag a little bit. As many of you know, we're, we're terribly modest and, and unfortunately much too so. But this week, Entrepreneur Magazine landed on my desk and we were ranked number seven in the country. And this is a tribute to... <laughs> this is a tribute to our outstanding faculty and dedicated staff. So it's really up to that. It's really because of that group. Um, that's the reason where we are today, and so thank you. Whether discussing pharmaceutical or techno technological industries, small businesses or large corporations, it is innovation that drives short and long-term success. And we intend to be the medium for providing the ideas and knowledge that you can effectively utilize and leverage for your own business. Part of our plan today is to understand innovation and make it relevant to the success of your business. In partnership with you, we are presenting a series of programs to help you respond to the challenges and new market opportunities, gain competitive advantage, improve growth and profitability, and fulfill your organizational mission. As many of you know, it's been a very busy year for us. In February, we inaugurated the CEO Innovation Lecture Series with Fred Hassan from Shearing Plow. We launched the Innovation Summit in April featuring Clay Christensen. And following today's event, we are presenting an innovative uh, innovation workshop it, at the start of November, and we'll be concluding the year on November 14th with the next CEO Innovation Lecture featuring BMW CEO Tom Pervez. In the new year, we'll launch an exciting and unique executive training program to help companies effectively implement innovation and strengthen our great state's industries in this ultra-competitive global environment. One of the most powerful new ways of thinking about innovation relates to open innovation. And the driving force in this area, the one who wrote the book, soon two books, is Henry Chesbro. His impressive bio is in your program. Please take a moment, or a few moments because it's rather long, to read about his accomplishments. He says we need a new logic of innovation. And he is the expert. We know this is going to be a fascinating and helpful presentation. I give you Henry Chesbro. Good morning to all of you. Whew. I think I'll stay away from that. Uh, everybody can hear me OK? And for those of you in the back, can you, can you actually see this? If you can't, I think we have handouts. So uh, if you can't see it here, uh, you already have it there. So, uh, but as we go along, we have the whole morning together, at least until 11 o'clock. So if I say things that confuse you or you're not quite sure what I'm saying, please stop me, clarify, because uh, others may not understand it either. If you have points where you disagree or you have other comments, we're going to save time 
for questions and answers, and I invite you uh, to bring those comments and questions then as well. Uh, Jim's given me a nice introduction already, so I don't want to uh, belabor that too much, but I do want to preface my remarks by observing a couple of things. Uh, we're talking today about innovation, but what my, my suggestion is that we don't think about innovation for innovation's sake. Rather, think of innovation as a source of growth. Uh, either growth in profits by improving your operational processes so that you can do more things with less, or sources of new revenue and new business so you can grow your top line. Uh, particularly for those of you in business, uh, you know, innovation is an intermediate input. Uh, in and of itself, it's not clear that having more of it is better than having less of it. But I think we can all agree that having more profit and more revenue from a business standpoint is good. And innovation is a means of doing this not through external acquisition, but through leveraging the knowledge, the talent, and the ideas that you have in your own organization. So that, let me start by saying that. Uh, a second thing I should say in the way of prefacing my remarks is that I grew up in Michigan. And for those of you who followed the auto industry, uh, it's been really sad to see how the last 30 or 40 years have unfolded. Uh, and we can't blame all of this only on innovation. But even today, as I look at the struggles that the companies are going through, uh, I can't help but think that one of the things that would really help improve this is if we could inject more innovation into the big three. Now, on their way to becoming the medium three. Uh, I think Toyota overtook Ford in 2003, and they're on a track to overtake GM in 2008. So this is another motivation uh, for me personally, is just watching the industry that I grew up uh, around uh, and the struggles that they've had. Now let's see if I can get my technology to work here. I've been armed with a pointer. Oh, I have to point here, don't I? Aha. So I want to do three things this morning. Uh, we're going to cover the first one before the break and the second two after the break. Uh, the first I topic I want to cover is this notion of open innovation. And I'll put some content around that. Uh, and that is the book uh, that came out uh, three years ago. And to my great delight, people still are interested in this. There are thousands of business books that come out each year. And most of us uh, never read any of them, and they die off quickly. And that's a good thing because we can't possibly keep track of all that stuff. Uh, this is one of the few that so far is still alive and kicking, and I didn't expect it, I'm delighted by it. So that's what we're gonna talk about in this first session. The second session is going to be uh, material from a new book coming out this December that's called Open Business Models. And I'll have more to say about that, and, and really two items. One is the, the second book, but also the implications for intellectual property. Uh, that are involved in this, in managing this open innovation model. Now, let me get a sense of the audience here. How many of you are working in industry right now? How many of you are from uh, government? Uh, academia? Uh, nonprofits and other? Oh, we've got a nice mixture here. Okay, so I hope there will be ideas and information for all of you. Uh, but just so you're clear, my research focus has been studying businesses, and so as we think about these ideas and what they might apply to in other areas, be mindful that my research base is from industry, so uh, there may have to be some adjustments made as we carry these ideas to other places. Okay, now I want to start the talk with a model. This is very typical of academics. We like to use models. Uh, and sometimes people misunderstand what academics mean by models. A model is not reality. Please don't see this as reality. Instead, look at this as hopefully a useful simplification of reality. So a lot of stuff in a model is left out. And it's left out on purpose. Because reality is too messy and complicated to look at it all at one time. So the, by leaving a lot of stuff out, a model invites more close attention to what's left in. So with that, let me present this model to you. This is a model of industrial research and development that you would find in our textbooks that we use to teach our students about how you do this stuff. 
The model begins with the company's science and technology base over here. And each of these little dots you can think of as a project. A project that's been launched from the knowledge and the science and the know-how you have for some new effort. And it goes into a process that I've represented by a, a funnel turned on its side. You'll sometimes see this represented as a pipeline as well. But in either case, the image of a funnel or a pipeline is for things to flow through and for nothing to spill or leak out. Now, once we go through this process, some portion of these projects are going to, many of these are going to be filtered out. And not everything that we start is going to go all the way through. But some portion will get out to the market in the form of new products and new services. And some portion of this activity we call research, and some other portion we call development. Often you'll see these together as R and D. Now notice I call this a closed system. Now why do I call it a closed system? Well, because there's only one way in and there's only one way out in this model. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to this. Now there's some assumptions in this model. And the reason that this model is in our textbooks is that it's done really well in lots of industries for a long period of time. Uh, most business historians actually locate the first R&D labs in industry uh, in the German chemicals industry in the 19th century uh, with companies like Bayer and Hearst. And this model was brought over from Germany by DuPont uh, to the US. And for those of you who know the business history, the DuPont family was also very influential with General Motors in the automotive industry. And so the General Motors R&D system echoed the experiences of the DuPont system, which in turn came back to the German industry. Then we have Thomas Edison, who we sometimes think of as this individual entrepreneur, but in fact was very much a corporate innovator who helped create the beginnings of the GE laboratory system. So all these parties used that closed model, and it worked really well for a long time. For those of us from the local area, think of Bell Laboratories in the 1960s in communications as maybe the best example of a wonderful uh, innovation facility that came up with uh, many, many Nobel Prizes and scientific achievements uh, and created a lot of value along the way. This is what we mean by it. But there's some assumptions in this model that maybe weren't fully articulated as companies were using it. And as we look at these assumptions, you can begin to see some of the challenges that this model is now facing in our time. One challenge and one assumption is if I discover something, I'll find a market for that something. That's an assumption. There's no guarantee of that. The fact that you've discovered a new, neat new widget doesn't necessarily mean there's anybody who wants to buy that. So you really not only have to create the technology, you also have to go find or create the market for it as well. A second assumption is related to this. If I discover it first, I'll own it. That means not only that I will get to use it, but that I can prevent others from using it. And they can't easily get around that. This is an assumption. Sometimes true, oftentimes not true. A third assumption is that I can anticipate these things well in advance. And indeed, in this closed model, it's the companies that make the investments and make the commitments in advance that are positioned to win industry leadership down the road. So you can't be a Johnny come lately. You've really got to be a pioneer, a leader in this model, because it takes time for these ideas to work from the, all the way from the laboratory all the way out to the marketplace. A fourth assumption is that there are going to be a lot of things that we start that we don't finish. Think of them as misfits. These are regrettable, but what are you going to do? It's a cost of doing business in this model. Uh, it may seem like waste, but it's part of what you have to do because you can't finish everything that you start. And the last assumption is that the best people in this field work for us. And indeed, to make this model work well, you have to go out and recruit the best people from the best universities and bring them into your organization. And this is where companies that have achieved long-lasting leadership pride themselves on the quality of the people they're able to bring in. So 
having said a lot about this model, I now want to start to knock it down and tell you why I think it's no longer as useful a model in most industries. We might be able to come up with a couple where it still works well. But in most industries now, I think this model has become obsolete. And I'm going to identify five factors to explain that to you. And these, all five of these have a property of taking central repositories of knowledge and distributing and diffusing them very widely throughout the society. And so in the knowledge environment that we operate in, lots and lots of useful knowledge can be found in industries all over the country and indeed the world. So this is, and how did this happen? I'm going to identify five factors. The first one I want to point to is the mobility of the workforce. You know, not too long ago, a 30-year career with a gold watch was something that many people aspired to coming out of uh, a college or university. These days, the average engineer in the United States will have nine employers over his or her career. That means there are eight different times when the knowledge and ideas and experience you develop in one company move with you to a new company. And of course, nobody is paying the other company for the knowledge and experience and training that you've given them. So this acts to spread the knowledge much more widely. I used to work in the computer disk drive industry uh, for a company called Quantum that made hard disk drives. And we used to love to hire people from IBM. They made wonderful employees, really knowledgeable, very smart, lots and lots of experience. Now how did we get these people? How did we get people from IBM to come to a little company like ours? Well, we had stock options. We weren't a really big company, so you could actually see the results of your work much more clearly in our organization. We were growing fast, and that in itself was a very positive environment. And they often could come in at a higher level in the organization as well. But the, the key point here is that companies like ours could actually get excellent talent from places like IBM. Now a second factor is the universities. It turns out not too long ago that universities were very suspicious about business. That if we worked too closely with business, that could corrupt the purity of our work. These days, by contrast, places like the Rothman Institute demonstrate this. Universities are eager to collaborate with people in business. And there are, among other reasons, there's a really important practical reason. Money. In that earlier generation, most universities got most of their research funding from the government. These days, outside of the life sciences, professors at most universities get their research money more from industry than they do from the government. Even university professors can figure out that if that's where the money is coming from, our research agendas have to address the problems that industry is going to care about. And that indeed has happened. Uh, one quick example would be looking at the president of Stanford University over on the West Coast. John Hennessy is the president at Stanford. And his career is fascinating. He is an entrepreneur who has founded not one, but multiple startup companies. At the same time, he was the dean of the engineering school at Stanford before doing this. He still sits on the boards of lots of startup companies. Uh, today, he's the president of the university. A generation ago, that would have been unthinkable. A guy from industry heading one of the most elite universities anywhere in the world, and yet he is, in fact, I think, uh, celebrated as a really successful example of this new kind of fusion in the universities working closely with industry. A third factor is those of us who've grown up in the US, and I include myself in this, grew up at a time when we really had the edge in most of the industries around the world that, that were at the leading edge of technology. Most of those technologies and industries really grew fastest and started here first. That's no longer true. You'll see lots of companies, US companies, creating research labs in small countries like Finland or Israel or Taiwan because the technologies are actually emerging faster there than they are here. Look no further than your cell phone if you doubt any of this. I just came back from Europe and of course cell phones there work inside of elevators inside big concrete buildings uh, even in the, in the densest places where you think it'd be impossible to get a signal. Uh, I don't know about you but my cell phone service sucks <laughs> here in the US. 
So all the services and the value added that's been built on top of cell phones in Europe is just getting started here because the infrastructure here isn't ready yet. It's not robust yet, but it's well advanced and well deployed there already. So all the innovations that spin on top of that are advancing faster there than they are here. A fourth factor is the fact that the government's policies against monopolies and oligopolies have also had the effect of breaking up some of those big monopolies. Think of what's happened to poor AT&T. Uh, the government forces them to license their patents uh, without paying the shareholders. Then, of course, Judge Green breaks the company up into three parts. Then in 1996, uh, AT&T got broken up again into AT&T and Lucent and NCR. Um, now Alcatel's acquiring Lucent, and there's going to be another break off for the government research organizations. So poor Bell Labs has been hacked and whacked in all kinds of different areas, in part because of government policy. Uh, also, the actions of the government against Microsoft, although not successful yet, had the same kind of property. where we're, we're challenging those concentrations of economic power, and in the process, we're often breaking up some of the laboratory and R&D systems that support those organizations. Again, it spreads that knowledge more widely. And lastly, of course, since I'm from California, Silicon Valley, what would you expect? We've got to talk about venture capital. Uh, venture capital does not pay for research. Venture capital pays only for development. So the ideas might come from a university, they might come from a large company, they might come from a, a government research organization, but they came from somewhere else. But venture capital takes that idea, adds money to that to commercialize the idea in some new way. So that acts as well to spread that knowledge much more widely. And 25 years ago, venture capital was a tiny, tiny industry. Today, it's a global force. And so this is another factor that's acted to spread all this knowledge. Here's my one data chart, and I'm glad you've got copies of this, because uh, reading all the numbers on here would be tough. And I'm not going to make you read all the numbers uh, even now, but I do want to call your attention to just a few of them. These are data from the National Science Foundation. And the National Science Foundation does surveys uh, that are based on this, where they're actually surveying at the establishment level what R&D is being done and by whom. So these data don't include government spending on R&D, only private industry spending. And in 1981, these columns add to 100%. In 1981, more than 70% of the R&D being done in that year were being done in companies of more than 25,000 employees, big companies doing, at this time, most of the R&D spending uh, in the country at that time. In the same year, the small companies of less than 1,000 employees, if you add them all up, collectively were doing less than 5% of all the R&D. So if you're in 1981 in most industries and you're looking for where the new ideas, the hot technologies, the leading edge work are being done, you don't look at the small companies. What they're doing is small, derivative, maybe not very high quality, the best stuff are be, is being done at the biggest companies. Now let's look at those same data 20 years on. By 2001, those largest companies now are still the plurality of spending, but now they're just under 40% of all the spending. Meanwhile, those little companies of less than 1,000 employees are now almost a quarter of all the R&D spending in the United States. And for those of you who followed this, in many of the industries, it's not just the money in those small companies. The talent, from a human standpoint, is often quite high as well. Maybe it's a professor spinning out, or some of the graduate students of these professors spinning out, or a guy from IBM leaving and starting a new company. So the talent pool in those small companies is often surprisingly high as well. Question? You take an account of this graph, the number of companies, you just might be approaching a law of large numbers that would increase your percentage from 70 to 35 percent. There might be more companies with greater than 25,000 employees now. Ah. Well, uh, in, your, your point is correct in terms of uh, how this could work. If you've been following what's happening to the large companies, though, you wouldn't hold that view. Uh, we already, already talked about Bell Labs and what's happened there, and I mentioned in brief the big three in the auto industry. Uh, with the exception of a couple uh, of organizations I know of in, say, the life sciences and maybe Microsoft and software, 
large companies are actually shrinking their R&D spending. They're not expanding it. The other part of it, though, is there are many more small companies, too. And the claim I'm making here is that you no longer have to be big to be good, and that there are diminished economies of scale. In 1981, the biggest tended to be the most active and therefore the best. By 2001, there's a lot of activity, even in very small companies. So that good research practice and good innovation management means you've got to pay attention to a much broader set of organizations. That's all I'm really claiming with these data. Now, I did a bunch of research at one of those big companies that led me to some of these ideas. Uh, and this was done with the permission of Xerox, who very generously gave me access uh, to five of their corporate laboratories around the world. And this chart here is an internal chart from 1996, so about 10 years ago. And it looks a little bit like that model I was showing you earlier. Uh, the funnels represented a little differently, and those squares have now turned into ovals, but it's a similar concept where projects are being launched from the technology base and being moved through to the marketplace. One difference you'll see is they had three pathways out to the business groups, to an incubator, or licensing, or spin out. So now we have three pathways out instead of just one. The other thing, though, that I want to focus on here is that as they're managing the development of these projects, periodically they go through a review of those. And you might think of these as uh, phase gate or stage gate reviews of the projects very commonly practiced in most companies that are managing these processes. And I was studying how Xerox was making these reviews and which projects they continued with and which ones they stopped. And what I realized is that as they were making these decisions, they were very concerned about what I would characterize as measurement error. Now, I need to say a word about this. When you're in an early stage of innovation, looking at new markets or new technologies, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you're not exactly sure what's going to happen. You're also not entirely sure what your own technology is capable of and who the markets might be and what their needs might be. So you have a lot of uncertainty and very incomplete information. When you're making decisions in that kind of a setting, you're not going to get it right 100% of the time because there's too much unknown and you don't have enough information. Nonetheless, you've got to make judgments. You can't hold everything up until you figure all of it out. So you've got to continue with the best information you have, but you're going to make some measurement error. Now, measurement error comes in two varieties, the false positive error and a false negative error. The false positive error would be a project that makes it through this review and it looks good. Makes it through here, oh yeah, we believe it. It makes it here, it's going to be great. And it goes out into the marketplace and it fails. So you can see that's a very expensive failure. You've been through your whole process. All that cost, gone. Not only that, you could have done some other project instead. So you've got this opportunity cost for the one you might have done instead that might have worked. And then lastly, imagine the careers of the poor folks that were telling management not just once, but three or more times, as they're reviewing the project, they're telling management, it's going to be great, it's going to be great, you're going to love it, and then it fails. This is not a great way to build your career inside a company. So for a lot of good reasons, people at Xerox were trying to reduce the chance of this happening. They're trying to reduce the incidence of a false positive. So now let's step back for a second. If you're in an environment with a lot of uncertainty, and you don't have all the information, and you're trying to reduce the chance of a false positive, what in theory is going to happen to the chance of a false negative? I see people pointing up. Yes, if you try to reduce the type one false positives, you're going to inflate or increase the chance of a false negative. Now a false negative here is actually a more subtle concept. It's a project it gets to one of these gates, and it doesn't make it through. It gets stopped. So oftentimes, probably in organizations like yours too, once you stop these ideas, there's no further record. 
We don't really know what would have happened if we had continued the project. As it happened in my research in Xerox, I had the opportunity to go study projects and my research began when the project was stopped. And my research started by asking what happened after that. And I'll say some more about that in just a moment. Let me just conclude this slide set though by saying Xerox in their processes had no way of dealing with the risk of a false negative. And think about your own organization. If you, don't, if you have underlying uncertainty and you have incomplete information as well, my hunch is that you're a lot like Xerox. You're trying to reduce the chance of a false positive, and you probably haven't developed much of a process to deal with the possibility of making a false negative choice. So hold that thought and think about that in your own organization. One of the things that Xerox was doing is that they're selecting projects to fit their business model. And we talk a lot about business models, but we often don't define very much what we mean by a business model. I think if we think about the term, we often think of it like, how do I make money? Well, that's uh, perhaps accurate, but not very descriptive or helpful about what, how you would use a business model. So a colleague of mine from Harvard and I came up with a working definition that has six points to it that I think is a more practical way to understand business models and how Xerox was making these decisions. The business model as we define it starts outside the organization by looking at a market that you're trying to serve or a market segment. That's a set of customers you're focused on. You're not serving the whole world. You're trying to focus on a particular set of customers. The second point is once you've defined who you're trying to serve, you then have to ask what customer problem are we going to solve? Think of this as a value proposition. What's our value proposition to that market? It's not, gee, wouldn't it be cool if we could do more of this? It's from the customer's point of view, what are the customer's needs in that segment? And what are we going to do to solve those needs? Now, people in marketing will tell you that customer propositions run a range of things from very low value to very, very high value. And I think of these as vitamins on the low end and pain relievers on the high end. Uh, and a vitamin is something that, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I take vitamins, my doctors told me to take vitamins, and uh, supposedly it's good for my health if I do that. Uh, if I don't take my vitamins for a particular day, or if I even skip them for a week, I don't feel any different. But it's supposed to be good for me. Think about that as a vitamin. Well, how much am I willing to pay for vitamins? I don't really feel much benefit from them. In technology, a lot of companies that are trying to push more and more and faster, 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 often find that they're actually delivering vitamins because customers have other needs, other problems, and making this thing go faster and faster may have nothing to do with the problems that your customers are having. On the other end of the scale are the pain relievers. And if you need a pain reliever, you know you need a pain reliever. And if you take one and it works, you feel that. So the perceived value is quite high. And that means at least a couple of important things from a business model standpoint. Vitamins tend to have to be priced on cost, almost like commodities. Pain reliever value propositions can be priced on value, much higher margins. The second dimension is time. Things that are being used to purchase vitamins, there's no particular urgency, so the sales cycle could be fairly long. Things that really deliver relief for pain can have very short sales cycles. So think about very high value propositions. You can see the potential for value there. Once we've identified our market and what customer problem we're going to solve, now we can go into the company and say, OK, now what are the key attributes we must execute on to deliver this pain relief to our chosen customer segment? That allows us to say, OK, here are the key things. Let's focus on those. There may be other elements that have to be brought in to complete the solution, but we don't have to do all those ourselves. We could partner or collaborate with the other parts. What we want to make sure that we're in charge of are the things that really deliver the key value, because that's where the value is. That's where the profit is going to be. And this helps us then construct the value chain. From the raw materials all the way to the final consumer, what are the things that we're going to own and focus on ourselves? What are the things that we're going to partner and collaborate with from others to work this solution through uh, to the market we've chosen to serve? 
Now, once we've worked through these four points, now we can actually answer this question we often think of with a business model. How do we make money? How do we get paid? But now we've got a context to answer that question that we didn't have before. Now we know the market we're going after. We know what the customer's problems are. We think we've identified the key things we must do to solve that. And we've built the value chain, so we've got to leave some money for others to get them to play with us in doing this. Now we have a much better context to really assess how we're going to make money. And then one thing that we have learned from the technology sector is once you've built the value chain, there's actually a surrounding ecosystem or value network around that that can multiply the value of this solution. How many of you have teenage kids? Have you ever been to these Apple stores for the iPod? Have you seen all the accessories that are in these stores for the iPod? Apple does not make any of these accessories. No dollars of their assets are being used to create these accessories. But the presence of all these things that can either make the iPod work in your car or a really cool thing that you can hang on your purse or on your belt or all that stuff adds value to the iPod value chain and it multiplies the profits for Apple even though they don't have to invest any of their money to do it. That's what I mean by this ecosystem or value network around that. Question. One is your cost structure and your margin structure. Right, so cost and margin. And the other is a differentiated strategy. How you differentiate yourself. Yes, and actually in chapter four of Open Innovation, we talk about these, and those actually are in that description, because uh, I agree with you. I'm just trying to keep the list short here, because if I get too long, it gets no, no focus. Um, so in the case of, uh, of the iPod, for example, they do have to think about their margin structure. They thought a lot about how to differentiate uh, and so on. So excellent point. Now, the interesting thing about Xerox is that the Xerox's own history gave rise to what Xerox defined as its business model. And as it was looking through its R&D system and choosing which projects to continue through those stage gates, uh, I came to understand that this was actually conditioned by Xerox's own history. And so I want to take you back 50 years in time now through our Rothman Institute time machine uh, to the mid-50s and introduce you to Chester Carlson, who was the entrepreneur who invented, actually the inventor who invented this electrostatic charge to fix toner onto paper that became known as xerography. It turned out there were other ways of copying documents at the time. And those of us of a certain age might remember those mimeograph machines and the, uh, the smearing kinds of uh, carbon copy paper. Uh, or there were also some thermal processes you could use to copy a document, but the paper yellowed. And within a year, you couldn't read it anymore. But you could copy documents. Maybe you couldn't do it very well, but they were pretty cheap. Now, Joe Wilson, who is really the innovator and the entrepreneur in our story, meets up with Carlson. And he does a little bit of work to analyze what it might cost to build such a xerographic machine and finds out it's going to be more than six times the cost of those not very good but pretty cheap technologies that were already out there. So when they realize how much it's going to cost, they say, we better try to find some partnerships. So they go out to IBM, GE, and Kodak, which 50 years ago were already big, important companies. And they take this technology to them and they say, look, we've got the technology. We've actually now have got some patents for that technology. We'll supply the technology. You do the manufacturing and the distribution. We'll all make a lot of money. All three of them looked at it. All three of them said no. And what was interesting is that most of the time you have to sort of uh, make guesses about why they might have done this. But happily in this case, our friends at IBM commissioned a consulting firm, Arthur D. Little, to do a study of this while they were doing their due diligence. And my colleague at Harvard, Dick Rosenblum, has a copy of the Arthur D. Little study. So here's a case where we have the fossil record, if you will. We ordinarily don't get this in studying business. We have to make our best judgments. But here we actually have a true artifact of at least part of their decision process. And in the executive summary of the report from Arthur D. Little, and again, you can't read this here, but you've got it in front of you as well, Although it may be admirably suited for a few specialized applications, the Model 914 has no future in the office copy equipment market. Now, why would they say this? And I think it gets back to this issue of cost. 
that they were thinking about the fact this thing was so much more expensive than the other stuff that was out there. And people weren't copying documents very much to begin with. So except in a few cases where you really cared about high quality, you aren't going to have high volume use of this device. It's just too expensive, and particularly how people were using copies in those days. It didn't seem like to be a big market, except in some niches. Say, yes, AT&T had cell phone technology a long time ago. The gentleman here is saying this is what people said about cell phones, too. And for a long time, they were right, by the way, too. Those early cell phones were heavy. And if you weren't a salesperson in a car, you, you really couldn't use them. But today. Well, and I think it was Ken Olson from Digital who said, who would ever want a personal computer? And he said that in 1977. So this is, you're right, this is an example from Xerox, but you can think of others in other cases. And I think what happened, and the reason that we had Xerox become so successful, was not the technology. It was actually that Xerox found a different business model. So the ADL study was thinking about this technology kind of in a razor and razor blade business model. Once I sell you the razor, you've got to come back to me for all the consumables, the razor blades. And my razor might be priced at one margin, my consumables can be priced at big margins. Because once you've bought my razor, you know, I've got you. But of course, how do you get the customers to pay for a razor that costs more than six times as much as the other razors? They couldn't see a way around that. Wilson said, OK, I see the problem. So my solution is I'm not going to sell the razor. I'm going to lease the razor instead. And he put a bundle of, on a monthly lease with 2,000 copies for free thrown in, all for the low price of $95 a month for the Model 914 copier. Notice now this shifts the risk from the customer back to the supplier. If you build out all these machines, put them out on lease, they try them, they hate them, they send them back, you're out of business. The good news is if they try it and they like it, you're sitting on a cash machine because after those first 2,000 copies, every additional copy was priced at four cents, which was a nice high margin uh, back in the late 50s. Luckily for them, customers loved this. Many of them tried the machines, and on average, when they started using the machine, the copy volume rapidly grew, so they were making, on average, 2,000 copies a day from these machines. So by the second business day of the month, Xerox was collecting that four cents per copy out of all those machines installed out in the market. And this, this model allowed them to grow at a compounded rate of more than 40% a year for the next 15 years and took Xerox from a little company into the nifty 50 by the early 1970s. And it was on a technology that IBM, Kodak, and GE all looked at and turned down. So it wasn't the technology that changed. It was the business model that changed. So naturally, if you're Xerox and you've had this great success by the 70s, and you start building out your R&D laboratory system, what do you want from your laboratory system? You want things that can make that copy volume go faster and faster and faster. Because the sooner you get into that four cent per click territory, the sooner you start making new money. And indeed, if you look at how they managed their labs, they did a fantastic job of developing and finding technologies to really make those uh, copies quickly. On the other hand, Things that made copies very slowly weren't very attractive in this business model. And so when the Japanese companies came in in the 70s against Xerox, they didn't come in with the really high speed, high volume technologies. They were, they were in these very low priced, replaceable cartridge technologies, much more like the old razor and razor blade model, uh, at very low speeds of copying. So Xerox's own business model didn't make it very attractive uh, to go after this, kind, this market segment, and they essentially left a hole for new entrants once the government again forced Xerox to license their patents in 1975. That's another part of the story. Those great patent positions they had, the government thought it was so successful and, and so uh, strong that they actually broke it up and made them license it out. I don't think the government anticipated that most of the entry would come from Japan, but that was the government policy at the time. Now, now we go to the 70s, though. All right, is this before, before I get to the 70s. Can you repeat any questions that we're getting? Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll try to do that. I, was, I did try to repeat the idea. This is basically about the, uh, what's the problem to be solved 
versus what cool technology do we have? And oftentimes, people focus on the cool technology too much and not enough on what problems are we really trying to solve here. But thank you, good suggestion. So now I want to move us to the 70s. So think of polyester, think of disco. We've moved on from the 50s. Um, and inside one of these Xerox laboratories, the Palo Alto Research Center, Park, uh, we've got scientists working on lots of cool stuff. One of these scientists, two of them actually, uh, John Warnock and Charles Geschke, had a, a software technology that allowed people to take what was on a computer screen and print it onto a laser jet printed piece of paper. And we called this WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get, which today we take for granted. But prior to this time, could not be done. So Xerox was creating a machine called the Xerox Star that included these software technologies as part of their system. Xerox hardware, Xerox software, including these fonts with the Xerox laser printers. This was all part of the Star Office system. And typically, three workstations and a laser printer sold for about $100,000. Uh, in the Xerox model. So Warnock and Geschke say, you know, this is a great technology. This should be an industry standard for everybody to use. Xerox says, what are you talking about? This is one of our key differentiators. Back to our differentiation strategy. How do we make money if we give it away? Well, they never did a, come to agreement on that. And Warnock and Geschke leave, and there was enough technology in the public domain that they were able to continue working on these ideas and created a company called Adobe. We've all heard of Adobe, right? PostScript and all that good stuff. Well, the initial plan when they left Xerox, they had a business model in mind, and their business was a lot like the Xerox Star. They were going to do a turnkey publishing system, their own hardware, their own software, and the fonts. But here in the Rothman Institute of Entrepreneurship, you can well imagine that to get capital to do this, they have to go out and try to raise money. And as they raise money, they have to start talking to outside advisors and investors. And Gordon Bell, who was then at Digital, is now at Microsoft, and Steve Jobs, who was then at Apple and now is back at Apple, were two of the key parties they talked to with this initial idea in their mind. And both of them said, no, don't do that model. Don't do the turnkey system. We don't want or need all that. Just focus on the stuff that you can do and do try to create it as a de facto industry standard. And Apple even invested 5% in the company to kind of sweeten the deal. And this is a quotation from Charles Geschke, one of the two founders, saying that they didn't have this business model in mind originally. It only evolved after they were testing the idea and trying to raise money for it. But today, Adobe's market value is actually greater than that of Xerox. Even though the technology started inside of Xerox, and of course what I'm illustrating in this journey they went through is a change from the initial business model to a different, and in this case, more valuable business model. And it only came through the testing and experimenting and having to attract capital to get there. If they had kept the Xerox business model, I don't think it ever would have succeeded. And Geschke also doesn't think it would have succeeded. So what this, what this means is we actually have to think about innovation as involving two different kinds of processes. You need one process to minimize your type 1 errors, those false positives. And that's very much like a game of chess, where you have to think far ahead, you have to anticipate, make the investments today to give yourself a position to control the board and win the game later on. And if you don't make those investments and commitments, you're going to be overtaken by people who will. Uh, think of RCA in radios and televisions. It's an example of a company that failed to do this. Uh, they outsourced more and more of their manufacturing, and as it happened, more and more of the technology development uh, and so pretty soon, RCA became a nameplate uh, on the uh, television. And all the stuff, all the technology uh, came from the supply chain or from other companies uh, because they essentially didn't make the long-term investments to, su to sustain industry leadership. So you need to do this. And most companies that have gotten successful and large do this pretty well. But that's not enough now. For the Adobes, or the original Xerox 914, those you could think of as false negatives, projects that didn't have value in the current business model of the company, 
But if you could find a different business model, they might actually have real value. And so we need a process there that can find possible business models that aren't constrained by your current business model. That's a very different game. It's not a game of chess. It's much more like a game of poker, where you pay a little money to get the first cards, so you get a little information. Maybe you see some of yours, you see some of your, your opponents, and then you have to decide, do I want to stay in the game, get some new cards, get some more information, so you have to pay more money, or you can fold. And you have a series of these step-by-step -step decisions that you have to make. You don't have all the information at the beginning. Nobody has all the information. It's only the people that do the experiments to collect the information, either from the technology or the market. They're the only ones who are going to be able to play the game and win. That's what you need to manage these false negative situations. Now, when I told this to an executive at Intel, he said, OK, false negatives. I, I see what you're saying. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to review the list of projects I canceled last month. And we had to review these things, one of our phase reviews. And I and some of my colleagues we met, we made a whole list of what we were going to keep and what we were going to stop. I'm going to go back over that list again and just see, now that I've heard your spiel, would I do anything different than I did with the, my colleagues a month ago? So he goes back, and he calls me up a few days later. And he said, you know, I learned something surprisingly that really surprised me. Some of those projects that we canceled are still going on. The engineers that we told to stop didn't. They're still working on it. Now, where are they getting the money? Well, they're getting the money from other places. Maybe they're working part of the time on the project they're supposed to be on, but part of the time they're doing something else, and so on. The lesson for Intel is, do they just go back and, and tell everybody, no, no, we mean it, stop. No more. Or is there a signal here that maybe some of those projects that we tried to kill and didn't might be candidates for some other process uh, that might have value in a different business model? And if that's the case, maybe we should set up a second process to let some of those compete for money to a little bit of money to learn a little bit more, and then we can always kill it later. So that was one of the thoughts uh, from these false negatives. And in, if you look at Xerox, they did a good job of playing chess, and they were terrible, terrible at playing poker. And what I'm illustrating here uh, is a graph of the market value. So that's the number of shares of a company times the price of each share. That's how you get to this market value. So this would be 5 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion, and so on. So here's Xerox's market value, uh, pretty flat in the 90s and, or 80s. And in the 90s, they had a really nice run up before they had some unfortunate stuff happen in the very late 90s. And then there are these other projects that started in Xerox and got stopped. And then my research was tracking what happened afterward. Now, I found 35 of these projects, and 24 of the 35 went outside and never went anywhere. So from a, just that one sample, almost two-thirds of the projects weren't false negatives. They were just negatives. So it's not to say that everything that came out of Park uh, became fabulously successful. But 10 of them that left did become public companies. The 11th was sold to another company, and I don't track it here. And if you add up the market value of those 10 companies that did become public companies, you get this blue line here. It starts in the early 80s. And by the early 90s, it actually crosses the market value of Xerox itself. And by the end of my study, although it too had a, some unfortunate stuff at the end, it's more than twice the market value of Xerox itself from technologies that all started in Xerox. And 30 of the 35 projects actually had a license from Xerox to go to the outside. So it's not the case that Xerox fumbled these things. Xerox was actually ushering them out the door with licenses because they didn't see the value in their business model. So for playing chess, they were probably right. These things would not have been valuable if they had kept them in the company in the current business model. But from a poker standpoint, 
they might have missed a real chance to create some value if they could have found a set of processes to give these companies a way to find new business models. So the message here for you is that false negatives may have a real source of potential value. And back to the beginning of my talk, innovation is ultimately about growth, either growing your profits or growing your revenues. False negatives are a way of finding new opportunities for growth out of the ideas and technologies already in your organization. But we have to unleash them to have a way to find new business models to get that growth. And this requires a different approach to innovation. Uh, one that I call open innovation. Now why do I call it open? Well, at a high level it's because there are more ways in and there are more ways out. So it's much more open than that closed model where there was only one way in and only one way out. To get stepped down a little bit, you still have a lot of internal technology that you work on and you can still move that through to your current market like you do in the old model. So that's still a very important part of your innovation process. This is not a model about getting rid of your R&D. I'll have some examples for you in a few moments where you'll see that the companies doing this many times are still making major R&D investments internally. So this isn't about getting rid of all that. Instead, it's about complementing it and leveraging it with stuff from the outside. So we bring in external technologies, either at an early stage to join with our internal technology, or maybe we insource that at later stages to feed our marketplace. If it can fit your business model, whether it comes from inside or outside, it may be a very powerful way to grow your business. So that's half of it. The other half are those false negatives. Things that get part way into the process don't fit going into your current marketplace. And the old model, that was waste. Those were the misfits. In the new model, those are candidates for a second process that's more like this poker process to go find markets and business models outside of your current business through licensing or spin-offs, joint ventures, other things like this. So it's open coming in and open going out to the market. Now one of the things that's been enjoyable since I wrote the book is watching what other companies have started to do in using these ideas. So this is a representation of, of an open innovation process at a company from Holland called uh, DSM. It used to be known as Dutch State Mines. So the mining industry, I promise you I knew nothing about the mining industry when I wrote this book. But here's a company in the mining industry finding this is a very useful thing for them. And they draw it like a vortex. So things sort of spinning in, things flowing out, and I think it probably captures the turbulence that you might feel working with this model. Another one I like even more is from a Swedish company uh, in the construction industry. The construction industry. Who knew? So you take your funnel and you've got it trained at your current market. And the first thing you do in their conception, if you're trying to implement open innovation, is you drill holes in the funnel. So that things can flow in and flow out, rather than just being contained and not spilling or leaking. Then you start playing with the different pathways in this model. So as I said before, you can still take your internal technology to your current market. Excellent. A, that's the chess idea. You definitely want to do that. Uh, you can take your internal ideas to other markets uh, through licensing or spinning off where somebody else's business model is being used or a new venture has to find a new business model. You can also take external technologies and use them to help you get you into a new market. You can take external technologies into your current market. And my personal favorite, visually, is the boomerang, where you start internally with a project, it gets to some stage, it's allowed to go outside for a while, and then as you learn other information on the outside, you say, huh, that's actually more valuable than I thought, and you bring it back in again. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as spin-ins, as opposed to spin-outs. So this is a nice job, I think, of giving you a flavor for some of these ideas. Now with that, let me give you some illustrations of this, because this, be, this might seem rather abstract at this point. Um, I mentioned before IBM and competing against IBM in the disk drive business back in the 1980s. Uh, IBM is an enormously big, very successful company, and the kind of company you might think would have a really hard time changing its business model. 
and I have to give IBM credit. Although they nearly died before they did it, they actually did develop a very different, more innovative business model for the company. And I want to try to illustrate that in this model here. If you've ever seen Lou Gerstner's book, uh, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? He has a nice account uh, from his perspective of how that all happened. And as these CEO memoirs tend to be, uh, he gets most of the credit for most of what happened. If you talk to other people at IBM, they tend to think that they had a little something to do with it too. But in any case, you have to give the man credit. A lot of change happened. For one thing, IBM, of course, still has a lot of internal technology. They spend more than $6 billion a year on internal R&D, and they actually get more patents than any other company in the world from the US Patent and Trademark Office. And they've done this for about eight or nine years in a row. So again, this is not a model of getting rid of your internal R&D. There's still a major internal technology effort at IBM. But now, they add to that external technologies, and I've focused on two of them here in software, Java and Linux. Are you all familiar with Java and Linux? Eh, some, not everybody. These are software programs that IBM does not own and does not control. But IBM has more people working on each of these than any other company in the world. Isn't that interesting? They don't own them, but they got all these people working on them. Now why would they do that, apart from the fact that it irritates Microsoft? Why would you do this? Well, it turns out those technologies here are used by IBM to link up to some of their internal technology so that IBM stuff runs faster and better on this stuff. And it also helps IBM integrate with other people's technologies as well. Because another part of IBM's business is IBM Global Services, a unit that did not exist 15 years ago in IBM that today accounts for more than half of the company's revenue. And this is a $90 billion company. Half of their revenue from a group that didn't exist 15 years earlier. Now, global services has a very interesting value proposition to your customer. Whatever your IT needs, whatever equipment you've already bought and paid for, we will run it for you. If you want, we'll even hire your people and put them on our payroll. Take your facilities, put them on our balance sheet. We'll run as much of your IT as you let us do, no matter whose it is. Now, for those of us who can think back to the days of Big Blue, when it was all IBM all the time, this is a radical change in how they do business. It has an interesting consequence, among other things, for companies like Sun that compete with IBM in workstations and servers, IBM is one of their most important channels to market for their technologies. So IBM is a competitor and a customer. So it gives IBM an opportunity for real leadership uh, because they understand their customers' needs and they're actually in many cases running those uh, facilities for their customers. Tremendous innovation in the business model for IBM. Another thing they've done on the outbound side is that a lot of IBM technology is now being shared with others. In the semiconductor business, for example, IBM will now build your design on IBM's processes and act as a foundry for you. Now, IBM does this because semiconductor facilities are extremely expensive and you want to spread those fixed costs over more volume. So IBM gets lower costs for its internal use because you don't have as much overhead being laid on because it's being shared with other projects. Customers, in turn, get the benefit of IBM's intellectual property because IBM has all these cross-licensing agreements in manufacturing with all these other companies. So when you build your chip, on IBM's processes, you get the benefit of all that protection. So people can't come after you for infringing their manufacturing process patents because IBM's already been cross-licensed with them and they're your foundry. So it's a way of providing an IP umbrella as a foundry, if you will. A better business model will actually beat a better technology, if you had to choose. So that's the first thing to say. So this idea we ought to be thinking more about problems, than technologies, I would also say more about business models than technologies. And then as you get into these kinds of relationships, you, you're right, you have to align your business models if you're gonna do this sustainably. If IBM is making your chip, but IBM is hogging all the profit, you're gonna go use somebody else. 
Uh, if, on the other hand, you're making all the profit and IBM isn't getting anything, they're not going to do it anymore. So there has to be an alignment. If you're in, one interesting thing about IBM, though, is they will make chips for companies even if those chips compete with IBM chips. So you might think they wouldn't do that, but they actually think it's better, since you're going to be building the chip anyway somewhere, they think it's better you build it on IBM's processes uh, and, and IBM gets the benefit of that volume than having you not do it. But your fundamental idea that you have to think about the business models when you engage in these relationships is exactly right. And your experience, do companies that do practice open innovation fall into that pitfall and, and are not as flexible as they need to be with uh, broad range of business models, or do they? realize that and, and Do companies uh, think about this and manage these relationships this way? In my experience, I guess my answer would be mixed. I think some companies do. I think other companies uh, are thinking more tactically uh, and you know, they've evaluated alternative vendors uh, for who they're going to use or maybe they're, if they're the vendor they're evaluating which customers do they serve and I don't think they've thought about the larger business model aspects. So some yes, some no. Yes, and actually in the second part of our morning, I'm going to give you some ideas for thinking about the business models more directly. Uh, so that if you took this seriously, you could actually start to uh, implement some of those ideas. Yes? Isn't there a classic example that in some ways against this, and I guess Charlie Fine is your colleague. At MIT, Charlie Fine, yeah. He studied the industry when IBM decided to outsource. Get closer to the mic. IBM decided to outsource Intel and Microsoft. Right. And you know that famous saying, beware of Intel inside, because Intel made all the money with the PCs and Microsoft became a giant company. So, and that was a, a selected business model that IBM. Right. So, they selected the wrong business model. I mean, so you have to be very careful about business models. And I think uh, this is back to who was doing the investing and who was uh, building the long-term technology capabilities. Um, IBM in the PC business, they went off in 1980 and had about a 15-month period to create this new business. Uh, Don Estridge and his gang down in Boca Raton, Florida. And they come out in 1981 and they take the world by storm. By 1984, they've blown by Apple. They're the leading market share in this new industry. Fortune magazine puts IBM as the most admired business uh, of any company in the world. Uh, yet by 1987, 88, things start to fall apart. And we get into the Wintel experience that Charlie Fine and others have studied. So you can look at this and say, gee, for the first six years, what brilliant open innovation on IBM's part. Uh, and then after that, you go, ooh. Uh, and that might have been a case where they didn't do enough here, uh, in here. Now, I think another thing that happened with IBM is, for those of you who know the industry, they actually did try in 1987 to bring out something that was called the PS2 and the Systems Application Architecture, or SAA. And that was going to connect PCs to mainframes and back to the IBM assets uh, back in the glass house in, in the MIS department. Uh, the problem was there were all these industry standards and customers didn't really have that need as much as they had the need to get costs down or connect up laser printers. This stuff that we called networking began to get very popular between PCs. Uh, Robert Metcalf and 3Com start linking up PCs and laser printers, uh, not to SAA, but to these industry standards. And so that I think was part of the story too, is that they had maybe not enough of this and they also had a very proprietary answer rather than a more open technology platform. So I think the message here is that IBM's an example of a company that was very vertically integrated in their disk drive business and other products in the 80s, but by the 90s has become a much more open business model. How often do these companies build in an assessment of the effectiveness of their open innovation strategy and is it driven by crisis or is it driven by what, what shifts their reassessment? Yes, I think the um, uh, I, I would love to think that open innovation is so well known that companies every quarter are reassessing their open innovation strategy. Uh, I don't think it's happening either. Uh, in IBM's case, this didn't all happen in one fell swoop. This took many years and different parts of the organization did things differently. Uh, and I think it wasn't until well after 
many of the local choices were made that somebody up at corporate said, I know, we're actually doing, I don't know if they called it open innovation, but we're innovating differently now. Uh, so I think oftentimes it would either be a crisis or it would be some portion of the business trying something different, maybe just to out of desperation or necessity, and it works. Uh, and then when it works, other parts of the business want to understand that, and then I think you get some momentum that way. Now I am going to talk about a company called Procter & Gamble that had much more of a top-down uh, approach. So I will get to them in a minute. But for most companies, I think there's a crisis and some local experiments, and out of that grows this thing. Uh, there is a company now, Kraft Foods, that has a, an executive position they call Senior Vice President of Open Innovation. That's, the first, that's a new one on me. Hadn't seen that before. Uh, is it going to be a fad? Is it going to be a long-term trend? Uh, but we're just beginning to see a few of those where uh, maybe those people are actually looking across and assessing their open innovation strategies, but there aren't very many of them yet. 